The transfer itself might have provided a war movie's comic relief. Marine wags posted road signs reading Marines and men pointing south, and Army or 27th Division pointing north, together with USO and rest area. When their trucks passed each other, sometimes within inches, they shouted abuse at the retreating doggies and flung back the candy bars a few friendly GIs had tossed them with insulting barks. But other soldiers pretended to film the Leathernecks, mocking them as gung-ho savages who craved glory at any cost. Go ahead and bark, you bastards live like dogs anyway. The greenest marines were likely to shout the loudest, combat veterans tended to be quieter, but all cast an envious eye at army riches. When a 27th Division truck tipped over the shoulder of a meagre road, a band of marines stole their better carbines and ran off. Forty years later, 6th Division veterans would dwell on the exchange. What really made the memory durable was that it marked the trauma of returning to battle from the relative comfort and safety of the mopping up patrols and other occupation duties up north. I'd never been in combat before, so our fighting in the north surprised me, one Marine would recall. I mean, the pretty weak opposition and few casualties. We thought we were done with Okinawa and would be leaving soon, so going back into the slog down south was a shock. A much mellowed veteran would venture in retrospect that the taunting of GIs was all bravado to mask anxiety. Instead of the fantasy of going home for Christmas, they were going in to take over for the fucking 27th. Another would remember that resentment of the army really took root only after the Marines arrived in the south and began getting the crap kicked out of them. For it wasn't merely more combat they were returning to, but hardship that surpassed almost all they'd experienced. Sugarloaf Hill Three main defensive lines crossed Okinawa's south. The first, anchored by Kakazu Ridge and a collection of contiguous rises including Item Pocket, had been broken, chiefly by army units, but at a cost that had started the wrangling about Buckner's judgment. The Okinawan campaign was already longer than those for Saipan and Iwo Jima, and although its casualties were still about a quarter less than Iwo Jima's, the brass now knew the greatest bloodletting lay ahead. It was time to shorten it by breaking the back of the defence. The ventures of Paul Dunfrey's platoon across the muddy Asakawa on May 9th and 10th were feelers for a general offensive the following day, General Buckner's response to demands that he get moving again. The full-scale attack on May 11th was intended to penetrate the second and best line, which guarded Shuri. It would take place across the full width of the island where the 10th Army was stalled, about 20 miles south of the landing beaches. The 7th Army Division was enjoying a brief rest after a brutal month taking the pinnacle and another defensive system at a group of hills near Kochi, where it unknowingly engaged Captain Kojo's battalion. Each of the other four divisions faced extremely formidable barriers at their places in the line. A large hill mass called Conical Hill confronted the 96th Army Division on the Pacific coast. The heights of Shuri itself awaited the 77th Army Division. On those heights' other flank, the 1st Marine Division faced one a ridge and one a draw, a giant moat that might have been created for the slaughter of anyone mad enough to enter it. The obstacles in the path of General Shepherds and Paul Dunfray's 6th Marine Division, just down from the north, seemed comparatively less difficult. It remained on the west coast facing the East China Sea, where the Asakawa and the Asato, another river farther south, rimmed some three miles of relatively flat land. Most of the 6th Division began the May 11th offensive a day earlier in order to cross the Asakawa, and some fairly open ground to the main fortifications. For G, George, Company of the 2nd Battalion, 22nd Regiment, May 10th, started in the pre-dawn darkness, at a point where the Asakawa was shallow enough to wade across. G222, comprising green men and savvy veterans of earlier Pacific combat, was a typical Marine company typically convinced it was far better than typical. Its young commander, Captain Owen Stebbins, had fought on the Marshall Islands and Guam after graduating from Officer Candidate School 
Having been wounded on Guam, he was as relieved as anyone at the ease of the company's landing on L Day and relatively painless April in the north. Good-natured Stebbins, who'd played football for Fresno State College, seemed to take everything in stride. Admiring him for his combat experience and fairness, his men were confident that nothing ever fazed him. But after crossing the Asakawa in the morning's dense fog, he was no less amazed by the scope and skill of the Japanese preparations than Paul Dunfrey had been. Their camouflage was so superb, even in fairly open territory, that some of my men were hit by machine gun fire from five yards away, and in the back because they had the terrific discipline to hold their fire until our patrols passed, or until our men came almost right up on top of them, so near they couldn't use mortars or grenadiers to knock out the machini guns or get back the wounded, who were just too close. When two of Stebbins's three infantry platoons were pinned down almost immediately, he was faced with one of the decisions that torment company commanders in the field. A scout cut down by a hidden Japanese machine gun lay within yards of it. Stebbins felt he couldn't attack the emplacement with grenades or mortar fire, because his man might be alive. He risked using his binoculars, whose glint in the sun now rising over the Japanese position would make him a special target. From 200 yards away, he saw the body wasn't moving, but still hesitated to use heavy armament until he could be sure. Now entered the element of chance that always determined life and death on the line. A medical corpsman who'd already saved several men by braving pinpointed hostile fire crawled out to rescue the scout while the machine gun still chattered. The wounded man was alive, because he happened to have fallen into a crease in the ground where further bullets whizzed over him, but now killed the corpsman. When Stebbins later had time to think beyond the demands of the field, he saw that twist of fate as yet another confirmation that combat was a constant roll of dice. The element of luck is enormous. One guy's miracle is the next guy's death. Two long days later, Stebbins's company was again pinned down by heavy, accurate fire from a hill in its path. It had been assigned a platoon of tanks to attack with it by Lieutenant Colonel Horatio Woodhouse, the commander of the 2nd Battalion. After encountering increasing fire as they neared that hill, the four tanks waited some 80 yards back. Stebbins himself was in an unprotected observation post, some 300 yards forward of the company's command post, where First Lieutenant Dale Bear, the executive officer, or second in command, was positioned with the machine gun officer. Stebbins's first platoon was on his right, the second on his left, and the third in a reserve position, just behind the company command post. Dashing to consult with him in his observation post, Second Lieutenant Edward Ruess reported that heavy fire had pinned down his platoon, the first, and was inflicting casualties. He hoped the tanks would help. Rising for a better look at how they should use the terrain, Stebbins was quickly hit by three machine gun bullets. He would recuperate for several months in a hospital and then go home, whereas the same burst that raked his little observation post, no doubt aimed at him, the officer, killed his runner. By that time, the single surviving rifleman in his forward observation post. His other runners had all been hit earlier. Meanwhile, Roos had sprinted back to his men, dodging, ducking, hitting the ground every ten yards. Platoon leaders were the officers who stood or crawled beside or in front of their men in battle. Known as one of the best, Roos was virtually idolised by his men for his leadership. Two days earlier, Stebbins had noticed a dirty bandage the lieutenant was trying to conceal. Shot through the hand the day before, shortly after crossing the Asakawe, he went without treatment in a battalion aid station because he wouldn't leave his men when things were getting difficult. Stebbins also knew Rues would never let his platoon stay, Pined, down long, which is why the captain had chosen it to lead the way onto the troublesome hill ahead. Fearless, tiger quick. Ruiz liked to fix the positions of machine guns that were pinning down his men by showing himself to draw their fire but this hill had too many concealed machine guns firing too great a volume of fire. Trying his daring move again, Roos was killed. The body of the runner who'd been killed beside Captain Stebbins tumbled into a decline. 
Unable to find his walkie-talkie radio, the captain crawled toward the rear until he was spotted by one of the tanks. It radioed the company command post, and stretcher-bearers were dispatched to bring the captain farther back. While he was being bandaged, he told Lieutenant Colonel Woodhouse, who'd run back from his battalion's forward observation post, that the tanks were needed quickly. Woodhouse took First Lieutenant Bear, who replaced Stebbins as company commander, to where they could coordinate another go at the hill. Runners were sent to inform the three platoons to ready themselves for a tank-supported attack to be led by Bear. The obstacle had to be taken quickly, as its fire was holding up the entire advance in the area. Casualties among the lieutenants serving as platoon leaders had been especially heavy in the two days following the crossing of the Asakawa. Stebbins had also lost the leader of his third platoon on that same advance, to mortifier in the morning fog of May 10th. His place was taken by platoon sergeant Edmund DeMar, the Brooklyn boy who'd ventured a spell in Miami before enlisting in 1940. Now 25 years old, DeMar was called not Pops, like so many men over 20, but Mommy, thanks to his regular admonitions to his teenage charges during their training. Do I always have to be a mother and father to you? When the runner arrived with the message from Bear, Mommy was in a protected little position near the company command post, several minutes run behind where Captain Stebbins had been hit. Despite the delay during the previous hours and the casualties to the company's two other platoons, the new obstacle gave no indication that it would be uglier than others in the two-mile lake of fire since the Asakawa. The prominent hill, as the Americans referred to it, stood beyond a slight draw that formed a corridor leading up to it. A similar rise called Charlie Hill had fallen the day before to the 1st Battalion, after a day and a half of tank and infantry assault supported by naval gunfire. There was no reason to expect the new hill, barren except for a few scrubby trees, would be more difficult. Damar, studying it again from a few hundred yards north, saw it as just another lump, a brownish incline with a little knoll on top. G Company's return to combat had been hard. After suffering only two battle fatigue casualties during its weeks in the north, it lost nine men to exceptionally heavy artillery, mortar and small arms fire in just two days in the south, including five killed on the first day alone. Damar's 3rd platoon had escaped from one action only with the aid of a smokescreen, but the company would soon look back to those two days pushing south to here as almost easy going. At least everyone could still keep track of the killed and wounded. Actually, Damar was reassigning the functions of the missing men in his weakened platoon when the runner arrived with the order to meet with Lieutenant Bear for coordination. Damar had 28 men left of a full complement of 40. According to the plan, they would be joined by 19 men still fit for action from Dead Ed Ress's first platoon and be supported by the tank platoon. The hill had to be taken quickly because its machine guns and mortars were badly chewing up everything in sight, including other companies. The tanks were waiting in a depression not visible from the hill. When Lieutenant Bear gave platoon Sergeant Damar and the replacement for Ed Roos the plan of attack, they took the usual precaution of squatting far enough apart so that one mortar round couldn't hit them all. They were eager to learn one another's names to avoid calling out Lieutenant or Sergeant, another way of making themselves priority targets for snipers. The plan was straightforward. Damar and his men on the left, Bear and the reduced 1st platoon on the right, and the tanks moving out at the same time, while a machine gun section would give additional fire support as they advanced. The tank commander wanted assurance that he wouldn't be left high and dry. Tanks were a great advantage to the infantry they supported, and the American 10th Army had vastly more of them than the Japanese 32nd Army. But enemy fire of such intensity and accuracy turned even the best American Shermans into a danger too, as targets for concentrated salvos. Veterans learned to control their first instinct to crouch behind them for protection and to mistrust the false sense of security they provided. Especially when anti-tank guns and other armament zeroed in on their whistling and clanking, the instinct of troops at their sides was to scramble as far from them as quickly as possible 
leaving them vulnerable to dreaded Japanese infantrymen with satchel charges. Against powerful defences, therefore, tanks needed the protection of infantrymen as much as infantrymen needed the extra punch from tanks. Damar urged the lieutenant in command of those four Shermans not to worry. We'll stick to you like flies on shit. They synchronised watches. Jump-off time would be 1,600 hours on a signal from Lieutenant Bear. Damar returned to his platoon and gave the word. Final preparations were made for the attack. Waiting was a miniature pre-landing limbo, the men hoping the moment would come soon and that it never would. Damar worried about them, about the steady Japanese fire from both flanks and about communications because his radio had been knocked out. It would be nice, he mused, to be somewhere else. At 1600 hours, the lead Sherman's hatch cover closed and it started off with the third platoon. It was only minutes to the hill. Starting the climb, Damar and the others suddenly saw it was thick with guns. Tank fire had ripped down camouflage, exposing dozens, maybe hundreds, of emplacements now showing gun barrels and muzzle flashes. They didn't yet know that some of the most damaging fire pouring down on them was from other hills. Damar had no time to look at anything other than his men, some of whom were already down. The tanks were being hit just as fast by concealed expertly placed mines and anti-tank guns. Two were put out of action almost immediately. The crest was only a few hundred yards away. Hoping audacity would compensate for their lack of deception, the two platoons charged straight up and reached it, but with a much reduced complement. Bear spread his remaining dozen-odd men into shell holes, but the Japanese fire was so intense and the American already so diminished that the lieutenant, his radio communications also out, sent a man back to report that G needed help to hold the summit. Racing and dodging down, that messenger could see little movement among Damar's group, which was getting the hell beaten out of them. Nothing Damar had seen in combat, let alone in films, had prepared him for such concentration of incoming fire. It very quickly killed many of his men and left others unable to function as fire teams. Soon only a handful remained unhit, most prominently bare. The big, burly first lieutenant was a man of few words who, like Ed Ruess, had been among the non-commissioned officers selected for officer training as the Marines' need for more officers to replace casualties grew. He presented a fine target, but also served as an inspiration to the men as he tried to see to the wounded and rally the others. He motioned to Damar, something about one of the disabled tanks. Then he was violently spun around and Damar saw a large chunk had been ripped from his upper leg. But powerful Bear picked up a 30 calibre light machine gun from alongside its two dead operators, threw a belt of ammunition over his shoulder and, like a John Wayne character, laid out lead in the enemy's direction, one of the directions. It wasn't long before he took a second hit, this time in the arm cradling his machine gun. The lieutenant continued covering fire so that some men could crawl to help others who'd been wounded going up the hill until his third hit in the buttocks sent him spinning out of sight. Damar quickly threw some grenades and started crawling toward Bear. Then he felt as if someone had taken a log from a fire and slammed it with all his might into his leg. He went down flat and couldn't get up. Still down, he saw one of his third platoon men spring up and bang on a disabled tank with his rifle, after which the crew fired furiously for a moment against what looked like thousands of Japanese coming at us, as a crew member would later put it, until they ran out of ammunition and escaped through the tank's emergency hatch. Other tank crews continued firing, although their vehicles were burning, then leaped out to help wounded riflemen. There was no place anywhere to make a stand. Much later, in the sweet luxury of being alive to remember, Damar would quip it was a situation from which General Custer would have cut and run. Dirt had jammed his rifle. He had no cover or protection. Knowing a sniper was poised somewhere on his left, maybe the one who'd already hit him, all he could do was hug the ground for all he was worth. He heard cries from about ten yards away, he guessed, from a private named James Davis, whose size had earned him the nickname Little Bit. Strong and tough, nevertheless, Davis was only 18 years old, 
and his wounds were obviously very bad. He was crying for his parents to come get him. Damar grunted for him to shut up. Any noise there would probably be a fatal noise. When Davis eventually did fall silent, Damar hoped it was because he'd heard him. Disabled in the extremely precarious position on the crest, Damar thought of his own parents. He looked at his watch. It was 16.45 hours. 45 days, not minutes, seemed to have passed. Now no Americans at all seemed still to be firing, and he could see none except dead and wounded. What am I going to do? he asked himself, trying to stay calm. He decided to wait, head as flat on the ground as he could push it. It would soon be dark. His leg was numb and he'd lost a lot of blood, but he knew he could crawl. A figure slithering down the hill in the dark would most likely be finished off by his own troops, who would take him for a jap, especially at night when they were the only ones to move. He didn't even have that night's password. But those were problems for later. Now he could only lie where he was, still surprised and dismayed by the dense, accurate Japanese fire from big guns, small arms, hand grenades and mortars. Some time later, he heard a whisper. Damar, you hit bad? Can you crawl? Although he didn't recognise the voice of the man risking his own life for his, the sense of comradeship gave him an incredible lift. Can I crawl? he whispered back, his head still half buried in the mud. I can crawl back to the States. A good smoke screen was laid down, from smoke shells fired by the surviving tanks, Damar would later learn. He started down, someone joined him from behind and cut off his pack to ease his crawling. Finding a little ditch, he squeezed into it for cover and kept crawling until his hand touched the body of a rifleman from his platoon, who had a bullet hole between the eyes. He tried to pull the body with him, but the helper behind urged him to just get down off the hill for now. Although it would have been a four-minute stroll from summit to bottom, the incomprehensibly intense enemy fire made their progress painfully slow. Soon he came upon Lieutenant Bear, badly bleeding from his wounds, but trying to get his machine gun operating. Damar tossed him his pistol because he believed he had some hand grenades left for any Japanese who might try to hurl satchel charges against the tank he hoped would take him back. Reaching it, he saw Little Bit's body lying alongside, where it had been pulled by Jim Chason, the man who'd run to the command post for reinforcements, then run back up the murderous hill to help his buddies. A tank man quickly dressed Damar's wound, but Mommy refused to move until all known wounded had been brought down from the hill. Then he was hoisted up onto the turret, where another wounded man was soon placed beside him. Recognising the youthful voice of the tanker who'd rescued him from the hill, Damar took out his battle dressing, leaned toward him, and asked where he'd been hit. Five fast rounds cracked out. Four hit the expeditionary can. Five gallons of spare water or oil on the turret inches from Damar's head. The fifth hit his saviour behind the ear, splattering blood and brains all over Damar. Gripping the now grievously wounded boy as the tank roared off, he reached for his grenades and found he had none. His pouch had been shot off. When the tank made it back to Fox Company's command post, the young tank driver was dead. A sergeant asked how things were going. Pretty rough on that goddamn hill, answered Mommy, not suspecting how much rougher it would become. The full strength of the defences was still beyond his imagination, or that of any American, including General Buckner. Those were the first assaults on Sugarloaf Hill, as it would be christened two days later, when Lieutenant Colonel Woodhouse would call it by a name he'd used for objectives during training exercises on Guadalcanal. No more were made that day for the battalion commander, now aware that the objective was far more difficult than originally believed, withdrew G Company and called for air strikes. Starting the next day, the sequence of attacks became so confused, with so many Americans cut off from their units, that it was impossible to keep track of who reached the summit before he fell. Besides, Holes from both sides shelling were so large that men who crouched in them couldn't see members of other units yards away. What was known for certain was that five of Damar's third platoon were killed 
and 10 wounded on May 12th, a casualty rate of 50%. Other platoons lost even more men. On May 14th, G Company's three rifle platoons with their machine gun sections had to be consolidated into a single platoon, whose lieutenant would be killed that night. Sustained losses like this would quickly prostrate the 6th Division. The hated hill looked to most Americans less like anything involving sugar than a rectangular loaf of coral and volcanic rock. Stebbins and Damar weren't alone in wondering how such an object, seemingly less significant than the Kakazoo Ridge finally taken by the army, could cause such slaughter. To the 6th Division staff, it was merely a minor midway station wanted as a platform for fire support against a higher hill called Kokuba, about a mile farther south. Sugarloaf's 300 or so yards of frontage rose abruptly to a height of 60 feet from an area of plain before it, an unhappy feature to those who had to cross that open country, about the size of six football fields. The hill itself was low enough, especially in relation to the others in view of it, including the Shuri Heights, to appear almost negligible, a pimple of a hill, as one marine would call it 40 years later, still trying to fathom how it could have been so evil. A young man in the good shape of all infantrymen could run to its crest in three or four minutes, yet it would cost more casualties than any other single Pacific battle, on Iwo Jima or elsewhere. The next assaults were prompted not only by the continued need to take the hill for the sake of the advance, but also to stop its defenders from rolling hand grenades down on American wounded lying at the base. But shot to shit G Company was losing its power to attack on its own. Of the 215 men with which it had started on May 12th, down from a full complement of about 250, only 75, including just three officers, were fit to fight by nightfall. The summit was reached again the next day, but rapid counter-attacks drove the attackers off. On May 14th, Sugarloaf became the focus of the entire stalled division. The 22nd Regiment was ordered to take it before nightfall at any cost, but more Japanese artillery from Shuri and deadly fire from unapproachable anti-tank guns repulsed every attempt. All approaches to the hill that gave the slightest protection of defilade were covered by intense mortar fire. In the late afternoon, the commander of the 2nd Battalion ordered the remnants of G Company to try again, this time together with F Company. When the force of 150 reached the base of the hill two bloody hours later, 106 had been disabled, together with three of their four supporting tanks. Amazingly, the intensity of the mortar and machine gun fire seemed to have increased. Although riflemen normally carried almost 200 rounds in their rifles, belts and bandoliers, the counter-attacks from the reverse slope and flanks depleted their supply in minutes. The open killing field was now littered with smoking hulks of tanks and casualties who couldn't be recovered while it was still more or less light. Snipers were everywhere. But 26 men from a supply echelon now arrived with replenishment and Major Harry A. Courtney Jr., the battalion executive officer or assistant commander, had an idea. Courtney had spent the day and previous night with the forward units to bolster their morale after the loss of so many of their senior officers, especially G Company, which, after the wounding of Stebbins and Bear, was under its third commander. Now he formed up the new arrivals with the survivors of F and G companies. Pressed against the base under devastating fire, the 28-year-old major told the group that he wanted volunteers for a banzai of their own, otherwise the Japanese would be down with a counter-attack in the morning. That hill's got to be taken and we're going to do it. What do you say? All said yes, and they stormed up after dark. Comrades near the base braving continuing fire to collect the dead and wounded from the earlier attacks. At the same time, the exchange of grenades near the crest was at such close range that members of Courtney's group could hear Japanese grunting as they tossed theirs uphill. When Marines answered, their grenades raised so much dust that the hill slope was obscured. The dust turned to mud when a drenching rain resumed a few hours later. Then the rain of Japanese grenades and mortars grew more accurate. Courtney was killed by one or the other shortly after he reached the crest. He would be one of four 6th Division Marines awarded the Medal of Honor, three posthumously, 
Dale Bear received the Navy Cross. The leadership passed to Ed Pesseley, another first lieutenant up from the ranks, who'd taken over F Company earlier in the day when its commander was shot in the hip. The thinning force dug in and threw grenades to try to avert an imminent counterattack by Japanese, seen gathering in the light of illumination shells fired by American ships. A Japanese grenade in a steady barrage of them shot fragments into Pesseley. Bleeding from the chest, he radioed Colonel Woodhouse, who told him to try to hang on. He'd get as much fire as he could from every possible artillery battery, marine and army. The lieutenant colonel stayed on the radio with him all night, calling in coordinates for that artillery. Shortly after dawn, a handful of survivors, some fifteen of the sixty men who had stormed the crest with Courtney, withdrew, slightly protected from the severe Japanese fire by a morning mist. One of the lucky fifteen was Wendell Majors, a G Company rifleman who realised sometime after midnight that he was the only man left alive on the hill's left flank. Private Majors began inching closer toward what he hoped would be friends in the centre when a Navy star shell burst into light overhead. He dashed for the cover of a shell hole, jumped in, and felt a searing jolt. A bayonet fixed to a rifle, one of many weapons abandoned in earlier seesaw charges by both sides, had entered the back of his right thigh and was protruding from the front. Another lucky one was Irving Ertel, whom Damar had given command of a machine gun platoon in the emergency of the soaring casualties. Guys were all over the place, wounded, bleeding, dead, and the living could hardly move because you simply couldn't without getting hit. Then it got dark and I stayed below the crest all night because the air was still really thick with Japanese fire. The platoon was down to a few men, we just didn't have any guys left. Those who were left had reached the limit of endurance. Corporal Dan Derishuk had been assigned to protect the right flank with two machine guns and eight G Company Marines, all sunken-eyed with exhaustion after five days with almost no sleep since crossing the Asakawa. The corporal had actually fallen asleep while digging his foxhole the previous night. He was even more spent now, and his face ached from shrapnel wounds suffered the previous day, but there could be no sleep. Mortar fire knocked out one machine gun, and steady firing burned out the barrel of the other. Derishuk's eight men dwindled to three, one alternately crying out and moaning from a stomach wound, which brought more grenades down on the three survivors. But they managed to evacuate at dawn. After the seesawing of May 14th, the 2nd Battalion was a skeleton, and the entire 22nd Regiment was down to 62% of combat efficiency. May 15th was no better. The pitch of that day's fighting probably exceeded any in the division's history. Furious artillery and mortar barrages met the units that moved out early in the morning. The Japanese counter-attack that had driven the last of Major Courtney's group from the hill pushed it forward until early afternoon, retaking some precious ground just north of it. By the end of the day, the 2nd Battalion had to be withdrawn because it had taken more than 400 casualties, almost half its normal complement. Owen Stebbins's G-222 was down to one officer, a lieutenant who'd become the company commander, and a scattering of enlisted men. Further reduced by sickness and exhaustion, the battalion could field 282 effectives out of its normal complement of roughly 1,000 men. Two boys had returned to combat that afternoon, their wounds from up north patched on a hospital ship and in Hawaii. Not finding their unit before dark, they tried to wait out the night in the safety of a cave. But since all were too packed with other marines sheltering from the fire to squeeze in, they lay down just outside one of them, under a teepee formed by two huge rocks. A shell found its way even into what seemed that perfect cover and killed them before they could rejoin their buddies. Only the Shuri line in general has been more studied by military analysts than its sugarloaf segment. Attention well deserved, for the skill and sweat of Japanese groundworks were in dramatic evidence here. The terrain favoured them almost by the nature of things. Defenders almost always fortified the high ground, toward which attackers had to fight from below, along predictable routes. In this case, the Japanese had a better view of the attackers than usual, 
especially from the Shuri Heights that dominated the entire area. Their cave exits on the rear slopes and the flanks as well as the forward slope allowed defenders, protected from American shells, to rush out to counter-attack marines, who had reached the summit, and in force, because the unusually elaborate network of tunnels provided safe access for reinforcements. In addition, their machine gun emplacements, hidden mortars, and other defensive arrangements had been sighted with particular care, probably under General Cho's personal direction. The crux was that Sugarloaf Hill, or Heights 51.2, as the Japanese designated it, didn't stand alone in the defensive scheme, although the Marines began by attacking it alone. Much to the contrary, it was one component of a triangular system including Horseshoe Hill on the right and Half Moon, or Crescent, on the left. Those two formed a funnel for pouring dense fire down on Sugarloaf, especially on every square yard of the summit whenever Americans approached it, as Sergeant Damar and those who followed him discovered. The chance of surviving without a hit was measured in minutes rather than hours. Additional heavy artillery from the Shuri Heights behind Half Moon was less accurate on individuals, but more devastating to groups. More voluminous and more accurate than any previously encountered in the Pacific, the linked fire also ravaged troops attempting to flank Sugarloaf from either side. And, since many of the mortars were on the reverse slopes of Horseshoe and Half Moon, they were largely protected from American artillery and mortar fire until Sugarloaf could be taken. Few Americans there, as elsewhere in the best Japanese positions, saw the defenders at all. We were fighting an underground enemy the whole time, one of them realised after catching on to their strategy. But the Americans could advance only by showing themselves. Hell's Half Acre, the flat, bare ground beneath Sugarloaf and the other hills, exposed them to simultaneous crossfire from the several interlocking sources, unseen and unreachable positions, causing half to three quarters of the American casualties. At first we were totally unaware of the power of the whole defensive line and Sugarloaf's part in it, Captain Stebbins would put it with restrained regret. It took several days to begin grasping the extent to which it was fortified with pillboxes, tunnels, mazes and interlocking automatic weapons. It took another day before the mutually supporting system would become apparent, the key to the defence of that whole side of the island. From the air, the full line bore a resemblance to a series of spokes radiating down and out from the hub at Shuri. Sugarloaf was at the end of the one that reached farthest toward the western coast and Naha. That made it the key to the barrier protecting both Shuri and Naha, and explained Cho's personal interest in the preparations there and special reinforcements now ordered by Ushijima. The American response was less well conceived. No matter how heavy the supporting fire, a historian of Pacific combat has put it, a moment arrived when men had to stand up and run across naked ground into a level stream of bullets. But that moment might have been better chosen than on Sugarloaf, whose punishing triangular fort was further argument for devising something more imaginative than the Tenth Army's bludgeon, for outflanking by the line with a second landing in the far south, as General Buckner's critics advocated. However, the pain at Sugarloaf and almost everywhere else in the Shuri line evidently didn't prompt the commander to reconsider. A few infantrymen in the fighting units began to wonder, when off the line for breaks between their maulings, why they seemed to be fighting a Japanese fight, almost hand to hand, despite their huge advantage in equipment and firepower. The much vaunted, perhaps congenitally over optimistic American intelligence had again failed in this case to give unit commanders like Captain Stebbins and Sergeant Damar any idea of the deadliness of the Japanese preparations. Japanese forward observers happened to use Hill 51.2 for spotting during their months of artillery training. Thus their knowledge of the terrain was such that they often didn't have to adjust because they fired on the right spot the first time. We couldn't have done them a better favour than attacking there, according to General James Day, who fought on Sugarloaf and studied it during many later tours on Okinawa. They had us beautifully zeroed in. Sergeant Damar knew that without later study, 
It was like target practice for them from all those damn hills. They had every foot covered with grids. Above all, it was pounding from Shuri's big 150mm guns, hardly seen before in the Pacific, that made the battle horrendous for the Marines. As the crow flies, Sugarloaf was about a mile from the 32nd Army headquarters in the tunnel deep beneath Shuri Castle. The battles being waged simultaneously along the rest of the eight-plus miles of the main Shuri line, separate pitched battles into which Buckner's general offensive had broken down almost immediately, were equally ferocious, though they seesawed less between attack and counterattack. The Shuri line was accomplishing for the Japanese much of what the French had hoped from their Maginot line, and that was far more Ushijima's feat than Imperial General Headquarters, since their support of him had been minimal for a campaign of such importance. Clinging to their fundamental belief in attack, IGHQ had resisted the Ushijima Yahara strategy of a war of attrition fought from underground. Besides, they had already decided that the Tenazan of Tenazans, for which all possible arms and equipment had to be husbanded, would take place on the mainland. Thus, the Shuri line was essentially the 32nd Army's own creation. Almost a quarter of a million men faced each other there. Two great armies, in William Manchester's telling image, squatting opposite one another in mud and smoke, locked together in unimaginable agony. In World War I's deepest combat, Manchester continued, Battalion Frontage, the length occupied by the battalion's thousand-odd men, was approximately 800 yards. Here it was less than 600 yards, about 18 inches per man. The military analyst Thomas Huber would agree. The fighting on Okinawa had features that were all its own, but even so its dynamics bore a startling resemblance to the fierce no-man's-land fighting of World War I. Almost without exception, the Japanese had constructed a fortified position on every hill and ridge line, with other positions heavily covering their approaches. Taking each little knob and crease, even when only ten yards away, was an operation in itself. A rear echelon army colonel who visited one of the line's easier sectors during a relative lull in the fighting was almost as overwhelmed as a civilian would have been. It was no miracle that two such congregations of men could cause each other so much torment. By that time, both had absorbed lessons that made the fighting harder. The Americans, among other things, had learned how to keep getting water and supplies to the front so their men could stay there. The Japanese had learned that the Banzai attacks to which they'd resorted on other islands were far less effective than the methodical warfare they were waging here. Despite the Marines' conviction that they were being used for target practice, the Japanese agony was greater than theirs. Sugarloaf's defenders were remnants of the 62nd Division, which had opposed the American attacks in most of the South, reinforced by the 15th Independent Regiment, airlifted to Okinawa the previous July to supplement the 44th Independent Mixed Brigade that had been largely lost on Toyama Maru. Led by a highly skilled colonel named Seiko Mita, the 15th Independent Regiment was also suffering heavy losses. But the Sugarloaf Complex had to be held as long as possible, and Ushijima committed some of his last reserves of well-trained infantry troops to reinforce the defence during the night of May 15th. They included a farmer named Masatsugu Shinohara. When the Americans had landed, Shinohara was stationed about 15 miles east on Tsukan Island in the Pacific. Tiny Tsukan controlled the entrance to large Nakagusuku Bay, which the invaders needed for an anchorage and landing supplies. Some 250 Americans set out in ten yellow rubber boats to take the little dot on the morning of April 6th, roughly when Yamato was setting out for Okinawa. Its little garrison had a field gun, two heavy machine guns and four mortars. As the enemy boats approached, Shinohara, leader of a mortar section, chased them off with some deadly rounds, after which American bombs shook the island for days, preparing for a second landing led by amphibious tanks. Of the defending force of 60, 12 survived to follow their orders to find a way to rejoin the rest of the regiment on Okinawa. Crossing the 15 miles in diminutive fishing boats, 
they snuck through the American force already controlling the Okinawan coast where they landed. On Sugarloaf's rear, southern slope, Shinohara and other Suken survivors crept through trenches to carry mortar shells to their positions. To avoid the enemy observation planes that seemed to be always hovering over them, they worked at night and tried not to move in daylight except to fire their mortars. Their rations consisted of dried biscuits only. They had no sleep during their 72 hours on or beside the hill. Although the prodigious defensive works and their firepower dismayed the Americans, the Japanese saw themselves as children fighting giants. Still, Hill 51.2, the anchor for nearby Shuri, had to be held, no matter how impossible that seemed. Some remembered the feats of arms, courage and endurance on the 203 heights, a key hill in the high ground around Port Arthur that the Japanese had simply had to take in the 1905 war with Russia, and did. Few hated the Americans now, there was no energy for that. But all knew the enemy, as obsessed with Sugarloaf as he was, must be killed because failure would lead directly to the loss of Okinawa, then the same kind of vicious assault on the homeland. Meanwhile, short rounds from the heavy artillery at Shuri inevitably killed many Japanese too. When Shinohara was at last withdrawn from Sugarloaf, 55 of the original Sukan group of 60, including its commander, were dead. The Americans, even those who had landed on Okinawa loathing everything Japanese, retained no more energy than their enemy for the luxury of hatred. We were past that, past bitterness. This was simply the ultimate athletic contest that you had to win. A contest with literal sudden death and no overtime. After 96 hours, most Americans were too depleted to remember what happened with much clarity. Some could hardly tell in which direction they were looking. The mental exhaustion led to many extra casualties, because not enough adrenaline continued pumping to maintain the concentration that would have prevented stupid mistakes. Most of the 22nd Regiment was approaching that state on May 16th, which some felt exceeded May 15th as the 6th Division's hardest day of the campaign and the war. Several companies of the 29th, including Dick Whittaker's, had recently joined the battle. Units of both regiments launched a general assault on the hill from the front and both flanks and were met by crippling defensive fire. Replacements had replaced replacements, and reformed units were again so badly shot up that some survivors had to take their organisation into their own hands. The day's huge losses had again produced no territorial gain. Before dark on that May 16th, Anthony Cortese of Company, I-322, ran to the top of a little hill called Chocolate Drop and looked at Sugarloaf through his lieutenant's binoculars. He couldn't believe what I saw. It was covered with dead marines, a few enemy too, but mostly our guys, maybe a few hundred in my view alone. Cortese also saw some Japanese rebuilding their positions and ran back to tell his lieutenant that Sugarloaf had to be softened up with more artillery before they went in. But the next day, up we go into the slaughter, just like the others. That next day, three battleships moved in close to blast Sugarloaf, Horseshoe and Half Moon with their heavy guns, while aircraft carriers launched waves of bombing strikes. Then all three hills were attacked. Cortese's company of 245 men ended with three fit to fight. Two of them, including Cortese, quickly set up a machine gun to stop a counter-attack until yet more reinforcements could be rushed in. Dick Whittaker was told his go at Sugarloaf was the 11th, when his stint unloading invasion supplies on the landing beaches ended and he was assigned to F Company, 29th Marines, Private Whitaker was made a helper in a machine gun squad, charged with lugging ammunition to the gun and protecting it with his rifle. Both his cans of 30 calibre ammunition, carried in addition to his pack and his own M1 ammunition, weighed about 20 pounds. But the hill seemed to him, as to all the others in the previous ten or so charges, almost insignificant in size, especially in its present blackened, denuded condition. His platoon began attacking it shortly after seven o'clock on the morning of the 17th, single file, Whittaker third in line. 
Mortar fire cascaded on the little column as if the Japanese had been preparing for them alone throughout the night. Running, panting, sweating, thinking of nothing, not even of what his body was doing. Whittaker pushed forward and upward as if the absurdity were happening to someone else. Three squads with three water-cooled machine guns followed a lieutenant whose name he couldn't remember, the young replacement having appeared only hours before to take over the platoon. The attack plan, to move right at the crest, never had a chance. Whittaker couldn't tell where the bullets and shells were coming from, only that he now understood the expression withering fire. As the men neared the crest, enormous and stunningly accurate fire from mortars, machine guns and rifles deluged them, shaking the ground. When they reached it, they were showered with hand grenades from unseen positions on the reverse slope. The next minutes seemed years. At the crest, the platoon couldn't unlimber their guns. Even if the right targets could have been found, it was impossible to set up the machine guns because each move out of a shell hole or scar in the ground brought another deadly burst of fire. Whittaker's gunner was hit. The new lieutenant was killed four steps in front of him. When the platoon finally did manage to set up despite the casualties, it was so outgunned that the men hardly knew where to shoot. Desperate non-stop firing burned out the barrels of all three machine guns. Whittaker realised that even if they somehow held on, the Japanese on the reverse slope would continue pinning them down indefinitely. He was frightened out of his mind, yet impervious to fright because the scene was beyond his ability to grasp. Down the line from him, more men kept getting hit as they sought cover until someone, Whittaker thought a sergeant, yelled, Let's get the hell out of here. But getting out would prove harder than getting up. Whittaker and another private named John Centerfit picked up their gunner, groaning from a bad stomach wound, and tried to take him down to safety. Fierce mortar fire resumed the moment they started. Panting from the strain and from exhaustion, they took a measure of refuge in a shell hole. Other men passed them, carrying and supporting their own wounded through the smoke. Corpsmen, they yelled. Corpsmen! A corpsman was found only when the two crawled to the bottom and across a portion of the open killing area to the marginal protection of the back of a small elevation north of the hill. Without glancing back, Whittaker carried the noise of Sugarloaf's ferocious fire in his ears. It was not yet 8am on the fifth day at the hill. His fifteen minutes going up, taking fire and coming down, had been beyond belief. It would later strike him that war is hell was a silly metaphor because no one has been to hell with the possible exception of Dante. He would prefer hell is war, but such conceptual notions did not come to him in the filth and fear themselves, when nothing mattered that wasn't immediate, instant. One of Ernie Pyle's last observations on Okinawa was that life up there at the front is very simple, very uncomplicated, devoid of all the jealousy and meanness that float around a headquarter city. Men continued worrying about their buddies after coming down from Sugarloaf. Did we get everyone off? Did we leave anyone up there in that hell? Slowly, immense relief that his duty there was over for now began washing over Whittaker, together with a vague hope he wouldn't have to go up again. It was up to his officers to think and to order that the hill must be taken. He only felt profoundly happy to have made it down. Attack, counter-attack, attack, counter-attack. Each time units were pushed back, it was with many or most of their men killed or missing. The wounded were pulled into craters until corsemen or fellow fighters chose a time to risk slipping out to them. Scatterings of unhit men left behind in holes fell asleep from exhaustion that conquered even fear of their hopeless situation out there all alone. Part of F Company would go up again, but without Whittaker's decimated platoon. Later on May 17, a company of the same 29th Regiment was driven off three times, the remnants by bayonet charges. Although a fourth attempt might have succeeded, their ammunition was exhausted, and too few men were left to spare help for the wounded. The Japanese didn't know the attackers could not persist much longer because no more replacements were available. 
but their own casualties had been so heavy that the general in command of the defending forces doubted he could hold on another day. Assembling the last of his reserves from the caves of Horseshoe and Half Moon, he told them that fresh troops would arrive in three days. Meanwhile, they must defend Sugarloaf to the death. After dusk, he sent them to reinforce the shredded units there. But Americans had taken enough of the little rises to detect their movement. No fewer than 12 battalions of marine artillery fired violently on the intended reinforcements, probably killing and otherwise disabling all but a dozen. In all, 6th Division artillery fired 92,560 shells in the Sugarloaf engagement. That helped quicken the end for the Japanese the following morning, May 18th. The commander of D-229 Company sent half his men around the right side of the hill with tanks. When they had engaged the defenders' attention, he sent the other half, also with close tank support, around the left flank. That turned out to be the final charge. The 1st Marine Division's taking of one a draw and one a ridge at last had silenced some of the artillery fire from there, two miles northeast. Here, enough damage had been done to the Japanese guns on the Triangle's other two hills to enable the tanks to work their way ahead while 80 men from D Company ran up the forward slope to the summit. Although six tanks were quickly knocked out, the other flankers encircled the hill from both sides and fired into the Japanese positions on the reverse slope while the infantrymen showered them with grenades. An hour of savage fighting followed, desperately brave Japanese squads attacking with satchel charges. By then, the defenders had been weakened enough for the Marines to properly dig in. By nightfall, the organised defence system had at last been cracked after the hardest single battle in the Pacific War, and by some measures the hardest for Americans anywhere in World War II. The next day, General Shepard, commander of the 6th Marine Division, received a dispatch from his immediate boss, a Buckner subordinate. Resistance and determination with which elements of your division attacked and finally captured Sugarloaf is indicative of the fighting spirit of your men. Ex my hearty congratulations to the officers and men concerned. That night, a newly deployed Marine sat in one of the deepest foxholes I'd ever seen atop Sugarloaf. Now that there was time to look, Nahar's smoking ruins, only two miles southwest, could be seen from the crest. The stench of Japanese corpses, piles of which had been collecting for days, and of American ones too, was indescribable. His own squad was down to four men. Flares from nearby warships kept the area as light as day all night long. We lost many men that night and the next day. So did other American units. The battle still wasn't over. Sister companies D and E of Whittaker's F Company took heavy casualties on May 19th and 20 from fire from Sugarloaf's rear slope as well as neighbouring hills. Taking a hill was a very loose term there, Whittaker's company commander would explain, because our men hadn't gone inside it, where many Japs were still fighting from all those caves. My own company had a night of terrible casualties after Sugarloaf was officially secured. There seemed no end to it. Certainly not the night of May 20th, when a machine gun squad was included in reinforcements sent out at 10pm, one of the rare American advances after dark, to support an infantry company that had suffered heavy casualties repelling a counter-attack. The squad's sergeant had just managed to find cover in a trench when all hell broke loose between Sugarloaf and Horseshoe Ridge. General James Day's studies of Sugarloaf during his tours of duty on Okinawa, most notably 40 years after the battle when he would command all US forces on the island, were prompted by his old fighting days, when he, a young corporal, was wounded on the hill. Day would conclude that more men were killed per square foot there, mostly in the open killing area beneath the hill, than anywhere else, including the larger and longer battles. The profusion of casualties stunned even the toughest veterans. Nearly 3,000 were killed and seriously wounded, roughly the same as on all of Tarawa and more than at Casino, and up to 50% more than the worst battle for a single position on Iwo Jima.
an additional 1,189 men were lost to sickness and combat exhaustion, but the numbers can't convey their effect upon the survivors. There was little hyperbole in a Marine's lament that battalions melted away, companies vanished. Parts of four battalions were mangled. Several rifle companies ended with a dozen men from their normal complement of roughly 250. In two, not a single officer or staff non-commissioned officer survived. In many others, privates ended in command of their shattered platoons. In Marine Evacuation Hospital No. 2, four or five men receiving transfusions in shock positions on litters learned they were their entire rifle company's only known survivors. Medical personnel observed that their dismay was exceeded only by that of the green troops who'd still been in boot camp on L-Day seven weeks earlier and were introduced to combat at Sugarloaf. So many tanks were knocked out that some companies alternated crews on the remaining ones. In the infantry, 11 of 18 company commanders, including Captain Stebbins, had been killed or wounded. Scarcely an original platoon leader escaped. Mommy Demar was G222's only exception, and he was a substitute. For the men who'd been pushed into this fierce cockpit for eight days, a survivor would remember, it seemed like an eternity. 18. Close Combat Sugarloaf's seizure opened the way to other strong points. Something snapped for the Japanese, as they knew it would, when the pivotal hill finally fell. Now the campaign would move more swiftly toward the American victory that had never been in doubt. But that's the historical view, reached in retrospective examinations like this one, which are as distant from the war as the daring new swimsuit advertisements installed in New York subway cars during the weeks when the Shuri Line was mangling 12,000 Americans. No one who dragged himself out of a foxhole at dawn knew that a climax had been reached around May 20th. The fighting remained equally desperate, if smaller in scope, at the hundreds of other fortifications that gave the campaign a fury, a storm of devastation, that surpassed the ground fighting seen anywhere else in the war, as Geoffrey Perret, a historian of US Army operations during World War II, would write. Together, the two army divisions east of Shuri took almost as many casualties as the 6th Marine Division on Sugarloaf to the west. The 1st Marine Division suffered more during the first two weeks of May than the 6th during the two weeks that included Sugarloaf. Okinawa's southern landscape was studded with hill turrets that repelled assaults like the posts of a pinball machine. There was the Chocolate Dropwort Hill Flattop Hill Complex, the Tiger Charlie Oboe Hill Complex, there were Hen, Hector, Conical, Red, Nan, Mabel, William, Howe and Dick Hills, Rocky Crags, Kakazoo West, Hills 60 and 178, Skyline Ridge, Ryan's Ridge, Garja Ridge. Hundreds of ridges and rises festooned with hidden gun emplacements, scores of escarpments where the Japanese positions were just as murderous to those hit by a howitzer shell or machine gun bullet. The struggles for those places differed chiefly in their duration. The colonel commanding the army's 383rd Infantry Regiment, which took Sugar Hill, eight miles east of Sugarloaf, saw the greatest display of courage of any group of men I've ever seen. Radio Tokyo caught the incongruity of the lethal obstacle's colourful nicknames. Sugarloaf Hill, Chocolate Drop, Strawberry Hill, gee, those places sound wonderful. You can see the candy houses with the white picket fences around them. But the only thing read about them is the blood of Americans. Perhaps that broadcast intentionally omitted such ridge names as Hand Grenade, Hacksaw, Bloody and Tombstone. There was also ironically named Easy Hill on the Oroku Peninsula, where units attempting an encircling movement would take fire from fellow units, and Lenley Cotton, the boy who'd schemed himself into combat by going AWOL, couldn't fire for fear of helping cut down Americans. Cotton's platoon leader shouted for binoculars, and someone handed him a pair. A bullet shattered his head before he could focus. On Charlie Hill, just before Sugarloaf, a squad of 16 flamethrower operators was cut to five. 
Two of those five were again advancing when a stunning barrage of mortar fire landed a shell between them, killing one and tossing the other through the air, the flamethrower ripped from his back. The following day, the latter was resting below the hill, nibbling at a sea ration. A shell from a smaller mortar hit the boy next to him in the back of his neck, blowing off his head and shooting his bloody brains all over the previous day's survivor and his can of hash. The rugged volunteer for the dangerous flame-throwing duty vomited uncontrollably. The fiercest artillery fire to hit Melvin Hecht's machine-gun section came at 7am on May 21st. When it missed his trench by yards, Hecht joined an attack on a ridge slightly south of Sugarloaf, which had been more or less secured three days earlier. May 23rd, when the unit pushed toward the outskirts of Nahar, was similar, except that several survivors cracked up under the strain, and one of the KIAs was good old Al, a staff sergeant who carried ammo when he could have been in rear echelon, a boy who volunteered for everything. One of that day's wounded had a leg blown off. They carried him into a wrecked hut and amputated with a kabar and pocket knife. Davis took it like a man and only screamed once. Tex Dury so sharpened the knife and off came the stub. Now five were left in Hecht's machine gun section, eight having been killed, nine wounded and one more or less permanently deranged. So it went for many fighting units. While it was strategically downhill from the breaking of the Shuri Line's cornerstones, and historically inevitable, very few fighters had any notion of that at the time.